Dr. Albert Macari comes from Timaru. He is an obstetrician and a gynaecologist. Uh, he was born in Egypt but has lived the past 23 years in the West. He's a father of three uh, and through his practice he's seen the destructive effects of alcohol and substance abuse on teenagers. His campaign is, I can't remember who I slept with, doctor, and it's attracted wide media attention. And he's uh, spent the last four years researching and developing his theory on alcohol and substance abuse and its impact on New Zealand society. He says we've normalised binge drinking and he wants to stigmatise it, demonise it, and the good doctor has a solution to the nation's alcohol problems and he wants you to get on board. Would you welcome, please, Dr. Albert Macari? When I first started this, I called it the biggest threat to our children, our country, and our society. And the reason that this is what I believe is the case. This is the biggest problem for New Zealand. The newspapers called it time to make a change. And when I presented it to the medical fraternity, I called it, doctor, I can't remember who I slept with because this is what I see every day. And this is a sentence which links the two problems together which is the binge drinking culture and the promiscuity. This is the easiest way I thought I explain what the problem is and how to sort it out. If you remember, this is the circle of decivilization or the circle of social decay. One night I woke up in the middle of the night and I could see this in front of me I thought this is really very easy to explain it everybody thinks they understand the problem and sometimes people say oh look 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 what do you know what you what don't know well, just tell us the answer and I say no you don't understand the problem really very well because a seven years under years old understand what money is his mother understands what money is and the governor of the reserve bank understand what money is so, yes, we understand what binge drink is, but some people say, look, it is the same. This, we have had this problem for years, for tens of years. And I say, no, it is not the same. The drinks are not the same, and the drunks are not the same. Let me talk first about the first S, which is substance abuse. The drinks are not the same, and then I will go to the point of how big is the problem and how we are shooting ourselves in the feet. The drinks are not the same because now, with the mixing of stimulants with the RTDs with the drinks, it takes an average of extra five drinks for a girl to start to feel wobbly on her feet compared to if she's drinking just alcohol. With this particular mix, you are more likely to have angry drunks rather than happy drunks. And this gives almost a two to three hundred percent possibility that this person will drink drive or sit beside a drunk driver, commit sexual assault, violent assault, or a crime. Is this worth thinking about? Why is this happening? There is a bit of science here. And the science is that the stimulant has got a shorter half-life than the alcohol. So when the stimulant effect with the extra five drinks in, on board, when the stimulant effect goes, boom, the girl who was walking around a few minutes before looking very happy falls in a heap. And she thinks that her drink has been spiked. No, 99% of the time the drink has not been spiked. This is the way this drink is designed to work if you overdo it. And then these girls get taken advantage of, they get raped, they can't remember who they slept with. Last week, you heard the story about the, guy, the son of Ruth Etkin on the aeroplane peeing on the passengers. He can't remember a thing. Okay, so now how big is the problem and how are we shooting ourselves in the feet? The problem is that we have 700,000 binge drinkers in New Zealand and almost 200,000 of those are alcoholics. If you think each of them is related to three or four people, then it's affecting the majority of the people. How are we shooting ourselves in the feet as a country, as a society? In our trial to do something good, we are doing something really bad. So in our trial to condemn the drink driving, we are promoting drunkness as an acceptable 
situation. So in other words, there is a culture. If you remember what happened yesterday, you haven't had enough fun. Which means it's absolutely perfect to get drunk so long as you don't drive. And it's absolutely perfect to have sex so long as you don't catch an STD or an unwanted pregnancy. So, who is doing that? Who is shooting us in the feet? Everybody. Even the police. Even the ads which are trying to control the problems. For many years, what have you watched on television? You watched ads, a sober driver, and four drunk people in the car. And it's giving it the thumbs up. So it doesn't matter what happened on the passenger seat. It doesn't, happen, it doesn't matter what happens on the back seat, so long as you have a sober driver. So what does this mean? It means that, think about it. If you wanted to teach a child not to steal, by saying, do not steal handbags from old women, do not steal handbags from old women, do not steal handbags from old women. Is this a good advice or a bad advice? Yeah, it is a bad advice, although you mean a good thing, because you set the bar too low. So what about stealing from older people? What about stealing, what about shoplifting? So you set the bar too low. So we did set the bar too low, by educating these people again and again and again, every day, even the police, giving the message, take one for the team, be the sober driver. So everybody, even the police, is saying it's absolutely fine to be drunk so long as you don't drive. We shot ourselves in the feet. We set the bar too low. We are teaching them not to steal by saying do not steal handbags from old women. So. I'm making the presentation very simple so that you remember it. Five letters, five words. In any activity in the world, whether you are killing somebody, whether you are peeing in the street, whether you are buying a piece of chocolate, any activity lies under these uh, categories. Is this a laser thing? Criminalize, decriminalize, trivialize, normalize, advertise, glamorize, and idealize. So, if you wanted to prevent something, you don't go and glamorize and idealize it. So let us take, for example, prostitution, which was being talked about. So prostitution has been decriminalized. It's in category two. But it should stay there. Just decriminalized. Because if you were to not just move it one notch to trivialize or normalize, then we should go to the secondary schools and tell the girls, all right, if you want to earn good money, meet a lot of people, nice people, and have a challenge, why don't you take prostitution as a career? Should we do that? So this is where some of the activities have to stay, in the category of decriminalize. But where are we with drunkness? Are we in category two? No, we are actually here. We are not only decriminalizing, trivializing, we are normalizing, advertising, and glamorizing, and idealizing it every day. Not only to the tune of paid advertisement for a quarter of a million dollars a day, and if this didn't work, they wouldn't have paid the money, but the unpaid advertisement. I'll give you an example. After my Sunday program on television talking about that, in the following few minutes there was, this is your life. And Prime Minister was sitting with the mad butcher, being honored with the knighthood. What did the mad butcher say? The guy is a wonderful guy, he has done a lot of good things in his life, he deserved the knighthood, etc. But I'm just showing you what unpaid advertisement is. He said, I'm an ordinary New Zealander, I say the F word, and I get drunk as often as I can. So this is unpaid advertising. This is normalizing and advertising and glamorizing. He was bragging about how he gets the old blacks and other people drunk. Here we go. By 16, 
most of them have been totally trolled at least once. Yeah. It's become quite a bit of like a rite of passage in New Zealand. You know, if you hold your liquor, you are sort of successful. It becomes like a kind of what you've got to do more than anything. Like, you're not the cool kid if you're in the corner just watching. You've got to be the one that's drinking, the one that's being the pup. The one that's being the party. There's a lot of pressure. And the problem is that this culture doesn't only affect those who are subscribing to it. As I will talk and allude later, it affects the people who don't subscribe to it by being marginalized, ostracized, bullied. Now, the problem is that these people don't get drunk and sit in a paddock and they sleep it out. No, they do things. Now, let me put it this way. If I take all of you guys, whether you are rich or poor or educated or uneducated or have high moral values or don't have high moral values, and I give you propofol, all of you will sleep to start with. You will lose your consciousness. However your strong will is, even if you are Michael Jackson, you could die if you are not attended by an anesthetist. Now, if I take, give you alcohol, it's a matter of dose related. You will relax first with the first drink or two, and then something else will happen, which I'll talk about in a second. And then, if you take more, you lose your consciousness. If you take more, you lose your life. So now, where is Bob McCoskery? He's not here. Right. Is his wife here? No? Here she is. Right. What do you think, Tina, Tina, what do you think stops your husband from pinching women's bottom in the street? <laughs> Even if nobody's looking, what do you think stops Bob McCoskey from pinching women's bottom in the street? Right? It's called inhibition. So this is the first thing which goes after the inverted comma relaxation to start with, inhibition goes. And inhibition is what stops the man in the street from behaving like the ram in the paddock. You drink a bit too much alcohol and you lose your inhibition. Which leads to the second S, which is the abuse of sex. And when I talk about abuse of sex, I'm not talking about sexual abuse, which I'm coming to in a minute. I'm talking about abuse of sex as a commodity, downgrading it from lovemaking into a meaningful relationship to paddock mating. And in the paddock, there are four things missing. Love, commitment, respect, and family. So, how bad is the problem? And how are we shooting ourselves in the feet? Again, you remember, do not steal handbags from old women. We set the bar too low. With the culture of, if you can remember what happened yesterday, you haven't had enough fun, it means that it's absolutely perfect to sleep with anybody who happened to be next to you in the party, so long as you don't catch an STD or an unwanted pregnancy. So if we, change, if we change sex education into a contraceptive lesson, listen to that. This is very dangerous because contraception does not protect against promiscuity. It actually helps it. So I'm not against contraception. I'm a gynecologist. I know that it's, there is a role for it. I know when used properly, it does a good job. It's about family planning. But if we use it as a tool to promote promiscuity and not address promiscuity as a problem, and which could be possibly bigger than unwanted pregnancies and STD, we are failing our young people. And we are not only failing our young people, we are failing our society in general. So, is promiscuity a problem or not? Is it a bad thing or is it okay? 
So, is it related to binge drinking and is ruining the lives of people or not? So, how bad is the problem and how are we shooting ourselves in the feet? The problem is really bad. Really, really bad. It can't be worse. In our tr in the Durex study 2007, New Zealand came as the most promiscuous nation in the world, with the average number of sexual partners per girl in the study of 22. And it was the only country in the world where girls are more promiscuous than boys. Again, we were shooting ourselves in the feet. We were trying to do something good, which is try to stop unsafe sex. But we were doing something bad, which is promoting, inverted comma, safe sex. So we are saying it's absolutely fine. Sex is a sport. You practice it so long as you are wearing the right gear, which means if you avoid STD and if you avoid unwanted pregnancy, it's fine. Go for it. But are there consequences? Not always. She's 14, lost her virginity at 30. Just the one partner or what? One More than one? Yeah. How many do you think? Um, 15. 15 boys. Mm -hmm. We can't identify her. She's still legally a child, still at school. But already she's had an STD and a pregnancy test. Have any of your friends got pregnant? Uh, yeah. Two. Two have got pregnant, yeah. Did they have the baby? One of them did. A lot of people would say 15 partners at the age of 14 is promiscuous. Do you see yourself being promiscuous? No. Um. How would you describe yourself? Experimenting. Right. I do apologize for the contents I'm going to show you now, but this is not about a politically correct presentation. This is about telling you the truth as it is. Okay? So I do apologize for the language, and if anybody can't put up with it, I'm really sorry. So where is this taking us? Like two boys, what's the roughest thing you've, you've ever heard happen to a girl down here? Like, get thrown around by the boys, what's the roughest thing you've spit heard? Spit roast, spit roast, eh? <laughs> that was the last night, mate. One in the puss, one in the mouth, eh? One in the mouth, Spit roast, one in the puss, one in the mouth. <laughs> This is what I'm talking about, paddock behavior. This is objectifying the girls and treating them like yous in the paddock. And this cannot be conducive to making them feel great about themselves. And we produced a documentary, a complete documentary, and one of the reasons why this guy was making this documentary was that he was talking to one of his wife's friends. She was so proud that in the orientation week, she slept with 20 guys in the university. And he said, no, I have to do something about it. So if we are going to claim this sexual behavior as a source of pride and invent a word, studies, unfortunately, we are removing from the dictionary another very good word with the most beautiful meaning, which is mum. And this is a direct effect of this way of behavior. This takes us to the third S, which is stability of relationship. So, now, when you have this level of promiscuity and sex is a sport, is this conducive to stable relationships? Do you think this would be conducive to these people being able to maintain relationship? I want you to listen to these two people and then I will just let you hear the third person. This is Mary, a patient of mine. Listen what she says about her husband. <coughs> Much as I did 58 years ago, I'm more mature now. And what do you think is the secret? And what do you think is the secret of that? Oh. 
give and take it and uh, trust in one another. It is so sad now that there's still a lot of lovely kids out there. It will turn the full cycle, I hope. So she's saying that she loves her husband the same way she loved him 57 years ago. At the time of romance, at the time of dating, at the time of good relationships. I work with young people aged between 13 and 16. They go out on the weekends and quite regularly come back to work on a Monday with hickeys all over their necks, down their chests. Um, when you talk to the children about this, boys and girls, they will reply that they don't know who they have been sleeping with or the number of people they've slept with. It always tends to be as a relation to alcohol and drugs from a heavy binging weekend that they've had. And they don't care about this. She's saying, she works with children and says, you come after the weekend all covered in hickeys and they can't remember who they slept with. Now, so this way, this culture cannot be conducive to stable relationships. Now, I want you to hear this charming young lady who summarizes, and I do apologize for the contents. Yourself, what do you think like the average person nowadays looks to get out of a relationship? Ready, sex, good tap, and that's about it really. Because I mean, fuck you young, go hard, eh? How is rooting a relationship though? <laughs> well, you're having sexual relations with them. Rooting is sexual relations, so that's a relationship, isn't it? Do you think the relationships and what you're doing now will affect your marriage one day? Probably, but I mean, that's the risk you've got to take, isn't it? You're young, young, dumb, full of cum. Fuck. That's it, really. I will say no more. So, the relationship stability goes out of the window. I was attending a conference in gynecology, about the biggest conference in contraception, and this was about commitment. So with the older women you were talking, I was mentioning now, this is like the love of the hunt, the romance, the dating, and these guys now with this culture, they are shooting in the paddock. It's boring, it's not stimulating, it's denigrating, it's offensive. So now. What can we do about it? In this conference, I learned that in some countries, less than 1% of the girls end up having sex with somebody who doesn't become their long-term partner or husband. And these people have a pair of testicles and a pair of ovaries and they have hormones. So why in this part of the world there is this commitment, there is this intimate relationship which doesn't seem to be existing here or it's going out of the window? Is it because the deal to commit is made under the effect of alcohol? Is it because it is made under the age of 13? Is it because it is never made and this is not an issue anymore? It's just me worrying about something which is not important. So with the stability of relationship going out of the window, relationships become disposable. And this disposability of relationship leads to a new shape of society where the family, as a, its inverted comma, usual form, is disappearing. And here I'm not talking religion, I'm not evangelizing, I'm not talking God, I'm not talking marriage even. I'm talking civilization. Keep it, stick to the basic, civilization, man, woman, and children. Is it a good idea to have the family as a building block of society, man, woman, and children? Or is this example an old way which we can do without. And as Bob was saying, we have now the lowest marriage since 18, 1971. There has been a drop of almost 65, 70%. Now, I know that some of the children from single parent families excel. They could become prime minister, minister of social affairs. Well, I understand that, but there is a huge difference between a single parent family which became single parent because the father died or the mother had a brain cancer and between a single parent family because the father defaulted or ran away with another woman 
there's a huge difference which affects the psychology of these children and their makeup and what they will become in the future. <coughs> we know that 60% of youth who commit suicide had a parent with substance abuse. We know that 50% were in SIF, and I'm not saying that SIF doesn't do a good job. I'm saying that a broken family is a catalyst for a lot of the symptoms which will develop later on. Which leads us to the fifth S, which is the safety of society or lack of it, or the symptoms of the problem. So these are the symptoms. The first one, and please note that the fifth S and the fourth S have got arrows in both directions. Like you can drink and go to the symptoms within half an hour, and you can feed the symptoms through the circle over the years. This woman was sitting in my living room saying that. And this is Jenny Brokenshire. Jenny Brokenshire can tell you how alcohol can destroy families. In April, her 16-year-old son William was stabbed to death in Oamaru. His assailant had been drinking. We've got a little one and she doesn't understand. She just, we go to visit the gravesite and she jumps out and she says, I'm going to find Will. It's like, <laughs> we'd all like to. Jenny has lost a son. So too have the parents of the boy who killed William. He's charged with murder. People don't sometimes intend to kill somebody, but it happens, accidents happen. And a lot of it is because there's no stopping them. They want, they want to get a few beers in them, they do. So we have now one of the highest violence incarceration rate in the world. When I came here to New Zealand 20 years ago, I used to know all the people who were murdered by name, Ben Smart, Olivia Hope, Olivia Hope, Ben Smart. Now, you open the front page of any newspaper in the country and you will see a homicide. Why? Why? Depression. 1.2 million scripts for depression in 2008 or 2009 in a 4 million population. Why? Why? Is this related to what we are talking about or not? And most of problems with depression are related to relationships. And if you go back into the circle and you see the unstable relationships, the sense of betrayal, etc., etc., is what makes people depressed. I'm not saying that every single case of depression is caused by that, but I'm saying there is a lot of overlap here. Use suicide. We have the highest youth suicide rate in the OECD, double that of the United States of America and Australia. So why do we have the highest youth suicide rate in the world? People don't know. I do. Because I have the best seat in the house. Everybody is trying to investigate. I'm an eyewitness of the crime. I can, I don't, because of the limited time, I can't, I don't want to to tell you now how many hats I'm wearing, but there are three people in the country who ha are wearing as many hats. And I'm seeing this. So when people say, oh, oh, this guy killed himself, we don't know why, I usually do, because I have inside information. The personality is still being made. The beam can take as much. If a man gets betrayed, or if a man is in a bad relationship, or his wife slept with another guy, etc., he finds it difficult. If a young guy finds this he, and he cannot cope with it, I'm not glamorizing suicide here, but what I'm saying is that it is not coincidence that we have the highest binge drinking rate in the world and the highest promiscuity rate in the world and the highest youth suicide rate in the world. We need to be dumb and stupid to think that this is coincidence. So it is time to address promiscuity as a catalyst for these problems as well. 
Sexual assault and rape. I explained at the beginning the relationship between RTDs and sexual assault. And because of the limited time, I don't want to go in details about that, but there is a difference between the abuse of sex and sexual abuse. Abuse of sex, I talked about it, downgrading it as a commodity from lovemaking to paddock mating, which happens within the first minute, once they are really completely drunk. But the sexual assault and rape could happen to innocent people who are not partaking into this, to people walking in the street minding their own business. And gosh, I come across these people and I know how they feel when they get raped. Do you think there's a danger with girls who get absolutely plastered and then sleep with a guy that they don't know and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know how you can, I don't know how you can fix it. So she's acknowledging that there is a problem, that she can get drunk and she could get raped, but can, how can you fix it? Right. Road toll and carnage. One death too much on the road is one death too much. And this is a door behind which my daughter was sitting. The thing which is there in the center of the car. This was the door. This. I'm lucky. I'm lucky. My daughter is becoming a doctor. She survived it. But many people don't. And many people do not wake up from the nightmare. I keep reminding myself how lucky I am by having the clothes which were torn from around her to save her life when the car was cut into too many pieces. And I find it unbelievable. I find it unbelievable how can we look at anybody in the face, and we know that 50% of fatal car accidents in New Zealand are associated with alcohol abuse and drug abuse, and we don't check, by the way, regularly for drugs. How can we look at the eyes of anybody who lost his child on the road and say it's perfectly all right to have the highest legal driving limit of alcohol, 0.08, compared to 0.05 like the rest of the world. How can we convince anybody of those that it's perfectly all right for a man to have seven stubbies in the last two hours and be driving on the opposite side of the road of this child? Why would your children be on the road when somebody legally has had seven stubbies and driving on the opposite side? I keep asking the question and nobody is answering. You know what? There are 300 international papers about that. And the cost of not lowering it is 137 times bigger. Financially. Forget about the lives. Even financially. Why? why what is the wisdom of that? Why, why do we think the whole world is wrong and we are right? Today, I'm getting to a stage where you have to take over because I'm tired. It's years now I've been doing that. And I wish the Prime Minister attended the talk, but unfortunately he didn't. So, this is a circle of decivilization or social decay. Now you understand it, and this is a diagnosis. Now you understand the diagnosis. How can we treat that? Solution. I will just put the solutions and then I will go rapidly through them one at a time. Apply medical science principle to social illness management. Decrease demand, not just to decrease supply. Discredit the ideology. Work at all levels simultaneously. Decide the ownership of the problem and the captainship of the management. I don't have to, the time to talk about how not to solve the problem because I was going to draw an analogy with the war and terror, the way it is conducted now and how you spend the trillions shooting yourself in the feet. 
but because of time restraint, I was going to explain it, but forget it now. Apply medical science principle to social illness management. In medicine, in medicine, concentrate with me, please, forget about the hell. In medicine, what do we do? We diagnose and then we treat. We don't just treat symptoms. We have to treat the cause of the problem. And what is the cause here? The cause here is a culture which says, if you can remember what happened yesterday, you have not had enough fun, which means it's absolutely fine to be drunk so long as you don't drive. It's absolutely fine to have sex with whoever happened to be next to you in the party so long as you don't catch an STD or an unwanted pregnancy. So this is the diagnosis. This is the problem. This is what needs to be treated. I'm not saying don't treat the symptoms, but which is the violence, the rape, the sexual assault, the road toll, the depression. These are the symptoms. The same like in the terrorism. The terrorism is a symptom. Yes, they are criminals. But how do you diagnose the cause? The ideology. This is an ideological war. And as with terrorism, you can't beat it with the bullets. You have to beat it at the ballots here. You have to change what is in people's heads. So the best way in medicine is to immunize. It's always cheaper and easier. So how do we immunize against this problem? How do we decrease demand, not de just decrease supply? So what do I mean by decrease demand, not just decrease supply? Decrease supply, very easy. Recommendation of the Law Commission Alcohol, Sir Jeffrey Palmer reports, and this was alluded to, raise the price, reduce uh, sale in the supermarkets, reduce advertising, blah, blah, blah. But reduce demand, what does reduce demand mean? Studies in the United States have shown that if you work only in reducing supply, you wouldn't succeed. You need to teach to reduce demand. You will hear that people say education doesn't work. I think this is an incomplete or incorrect sentence. Late education doesn't work. Wrong education doesn't work. And the motto, if you try to change a child after the age of five, it's dangerous. It, it wouldn't work. So how do you immunize? How do you reduce demand? You have to discredit the ideology. that in the pursuit of happiness, people have to be drunk or drugged. That in the pursuit of happiness, people should sleep with as many people as they can get. So we have to stop normalizing, advertising, glamorizing, and idealizing. Because you will not stop something by going down this way. You have to stigmatize it. We have to stigmatize it. And and Mr. Cameron, David Cameron, in, the United, in, in England recently is, is going along, along this way. Stop sexualizing children, stigmatize defaulting husbands or defaulting fathers, sorry, defaulting fathers. So we have to stigmatize. How do we stigmatize? We have to work at all levels. Right. So let us start with this little child here. We have to teach this three or four years old child that it's absolutely fine to go to mom or dad and say, look, I love you, but I really get scared when you get drunk. If you love me, please don't do that. This way you are using the most powerful thing in life, the love of a parent to a child. It is much stronger than the worry about the fine from the policeman or the worry about getting caught uh, drunk driving. We have to get this seven or eight years old girl to start thinking, who has got the better deal? Nana, who still loves granddad and they hold the hand and he kisses her and he calls her honey? Or my sister, who keeps coming drunk every weekend with a different guy in bed and she's always crying. This generation, which I call the lost generation, there is blood spilled on the floor now. My management is about stopping the bleeding, treating the cause, clamping the bleeding artery. So the parent, this one, has to go to the child and say, look, don't repeat my mistake. Don't repeat my mistake. 
I, I hear quote an example which the Prime Minister will have remembered. One day a girl said to me, Dr. McCarthy, in one of those presentations, she was crying at the back, a doctor, yeah, lady, and she said, look, I said, did I say something offensive? She said, no, you touched my heart. I said, what? She said, we are 27 cousins in the family, and 23 of us became drug addicts. Some of us took up prostitutions to be able to pay for it, and some committed suicide. I said, would you tell this to John Keyes? She said, yes, I would. I put her in front of him in the evening. She tells him the story. After she finished, she came and told me in front of my wife. I, want, I actually told him, but I didn't tell him everything. I said, what do you mean? She said, my mother is a drug dealer, and my brother is a policeman. So if a drug dealer can teach her children not to touch the stuff, then any parent can. This nana and the grandfather they have to step in and fill the gap when there is no good moral model at home. People are saying Albert McCary is trying to start the Nana Revolution, and the answer is yes. I'm trying to start the Nana Revolution. I'm trying to take the society back to where it was, because I think the Nana, the Nana generation is the generation when civilization peaked. And there is a lot of resources. Nana represents all what is wholesome, true, and corrupt, the clean, wise. She is always there for the children, the grandchildren. There is enormous amount of talent and dedication which you can draw from, and it is free, and she will love it. Now, so they have to step in community. Now, we have to use what we are strongest at to defeat and remove what we are worst at. New Zealand is the best country in the world when it comes to caring, communities, looking after one another. This is not my words, this is world statistics, all right, and polls. So the best country in the world for caring. So you have in these communities <coughs> many people who are willing to drive ambulances, to drive fire trucks, who, who looks after the fire service in New Zealand, mostly volunteer. So these guys, you can mobilize their efforts and they will love it, and the children will love it, especially when there is no good role model at home, and Christine Rankin will understand this better than anybody else because of her previous role. These guys have to talk to take these children and teach them how to get their buzz from catching a fish, from sliding down the slope, from doing the trick on the bike, from lighting the fire beside the tent, from giving a hand to somebody to stand up rather than beating the hell of somebody, somebody to get him to the ground. These people are there. There are hundreds of thousands of them, and their services are free. Nothing I'm asking for today costs money. It saves money. Schools. Schools, we have to dissociate alcohol from sports. We can't have sponsorship for sport. We can't take the player of the day and get him sculling alcohol as a celebration. We can tomorrow, and that's why I'm sad that John Key didn't attend. From tomorrow, we can get these schools to mobilize their talents and to mobilize their people to, to start stigmatizing this. How do you do that? Go and the lesson tomorrow in the morning could be who writes the best article about alcohol abuse or binge drinking? The best poem, the best act. And take the best people from the schools and get them to have their photo taken with the prime minister or with the all blacks. Media. The media should stop bad advertising. And by bad advertising, I mean not only drunkness as an acceptable way, but bad advertising sexually. You can't put a program called The Bachelorette and then confuse this eight or nine years old girl who sees this girl sleeping on Monday with this guy, Tuesday with this guy, Wednesday with this guy, Thursday with this guy, Friday with this guy, and it's all fun and game. Which one of the seven she slept with which she will choose to be with at the end? You are confusing this little girl. You are normalizing promiscuity in her head as an acceptable way of behavior. I, I, would, I can show you an example, one example or so from a complete media campaign I made about that. And uh, sport idols, I keep saying, please, if I can get Richie McCaw or Dan Carter to say, if you drink to get drunk, you are a bloody idiot and you could become a criminal. And if you drink and drive, you are a criminal. 
I tried my best. Uh, because of time restraints, I will not be able to tell you much more. There are people now who are happy to do that, but not, unfortunately, in the famous uh, stars. And if, if I can use your context to get these people to say this, this would be great. So the role models. I'm having some important people now who are happy to be role models, but I need the media. I understand. Government. The government now, they need to stop acting like politicians and they need to start speaking like clinician. What do I mean? When I find the patient with cancer coming to see me, I don't say, oh, how much money can I make out of her? I will treat the cancer, the money will come as a byproduct. Politicians as well, I found that they don't have ever green jobs. So the business of the votes and the elections is always in their mind. There is a second ranking as well of civil servants who run the country. So it's not just what the politician wants, they will change straight away. We need them to start working like judges rather than like lawyers. Good bedside manners are good, but they are not enough. The cancer has to be diagnosed and treated. So, today is as I'm at a stage where I either have to give up or carry on, because I tried my best. I've been on Sunday program, I've been on Campbell Live, I've been on breakfast, I've been everywhere. I am asking for the ownership of the problem to be adopted by everybody. And I understand here there are 80 organizations represented in you guys. I want as well the government to own, and I'm encouraged but why, by, by what Prime Minister has said. He seems to have a clear idea on what needs to be done. But the thinking has to be translated into action. So the captainship of the management, the A-team, why don't we have an A-team from Doug Selman, Professor of Psychology and Head of Addiction Institute in New Zealand, Paul Quigley, representing medicine, Peter Boschier, Head of, uh, sorry, Principal Youth Court Judge, Children Commissioner John Angus, or the new one, uh, Judy Bailey, uh, Bob McCoskey, you know, somebody representing national, somebody representing labor. And this team sees how we can stigmatize binge drinking I explained how big the problem is and how we are shooting ourselves in the feet. I cannot do this on my own. But with many like thinkers, you can move it. The scrum can move it. I want you to think to, about your children. Nobody's immune. Nothing is more important than our children. The team and the captain and the structures have to be established. Otherwise, it will be just talk. So today, I'm asking you, are you happy to have your children drunk and falling in the gutters, lying in the gutters every weekend? Or is there a better way of having fun? I'm asking you, do you want your daughters to be loved by this special person and adored by this special person? Or do you want them to be, and to make love in a meaningful relationship? Or do you want them to be treated like you in the paddock? Do you want your daughters and your children to have stable relationships? Or is promiscuity is okay? And the average number of sexual partner of 22 do you want relationship disposable to be disposable or are permanent? Do you want the family to be the building block of the society or a human paddock is fine? Do you want to see, is it okay to have 125,000 calls of family violence a year? Is it all right to have 50,000 cases of child abuse a, a year? Is it all right to have the highest use suicide rate in the world? Or is it time for a change? I'll just spend 30 seconds. I will not show the ads I produce. You can see this in the interval if you like. But I will say one thing. One day, a village was harvesting. And one child got lost. They kept looking and looking and looking for the child. They couldn't. The following morning, an old guy said, the whole village stand in a row, hold hands, and walk together, you will find the child. They found the child, but he was dead. And the mother held the child in her arms and said, if just somebody thought yesterday that we should hold hands together, my child would have been alive now. I'm asking you to hold hands together so that we stop people burying their children. Thank you.